Good evening, everyone. Good to see everybody. Many of you have watched the news recently about Tim Tebow. I'm assuming most of you know who Tim Tebow is. Well, he recently signed, I believe, a year contract with the Jacksonville Jaguars. He was friends with the new head coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars. And so there's been a lot of controversy surrounding whether or not he should sign. In fact, people have already politicized it, saying it's white privilege because they did not sign Colin Kaepernick. I don't want to get into the political side of it. But Charles Barkley made an interesting comment, and it was a complimentary comment about Tim Tebow. And here is what he said. I think it's going to be very difficult for him to just pick up a football another position. Tim is such a good dude. But you know, a lot of people don't like Tim because of his religion. And then he said this, he wears it on his sleeve. In other words, Tim Tebow practices what he preaches. And that's exactly what God wanted Israel to do. All that he had given them in terms of his commandments, he wanted them to wear them on their sleeves. And that's what we're looking at in the book of the covenant. So turn, if you will, to Exodus chapter 23. Uh, This is the last section before we get into chapter 24 of all the different laws that God has given. And again, as we've said to you a number of times, Israel has come out of Egypt. God has parted the Red Sea. They are now at Mount Sinai for about a year. And God is giving them his commandments there in order to de-Egyptianize them. And basically, what God did at Mount Sinai was he entered into what is called the Mosaic Covenant. There's a lot of covenants in the Bible. I don't want to go over those again. But the Mosaic Covenant, God basically said, if you obey me, I will bless you. If you don't obey me, I will curse you. And in the Mosaic Covenant, God gave the Ten Commandments, which were mentioned in chapter 19 and 20. And then he also gave the 70 Commandments, which are the Book of the Covenant, which is mentioned in Exodus 24, verse 7. And so we've been looking at the book of the covenant. Now, obviously, there are more than this, just these commandments. When you get into the book of Leviticus, you get into the book of Numbers, God gives further instruction. But a lot of that is also a repeat of this. And so God wanted Israel, as it were, to wear these commandments on their sleeves. He wanted them to demonstrate it. Now, as I said last time, you could take all of these commandments, the Ten Commandments, the Seventy Commandments, and you could distill them into three categories. You'll notice on the next slide, you have the civil laws, ceremonial laws, and the moral laws. All of the Ten Commandments, all of the Book of Covenant can be distilled into those three categories. And as we're going to see, some of those have been done away with. Now, this raises a question. I've said this before, but I want to repeat it again because if you're like me, I have to hear something over and over for it to sink into my mind. And this is a theological question that a lot of Christians ask. Are Christians still under the Mosaic law? This is something that is debated among theologians. And in one sense, the answer is no. We are not under the Mosaic law. For example, in Romans 6 verse 14, here was what the Apostle Paul said. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under what? Grace. Now, obviously, he's saying we're not under the law's penalty, because Jesus bore our penalty, and when we trust in Christ, the law's penalty has been removed in our life. So there's a sense in which we're not under the law, it's penalty. But on the other hand, we are under the law. Listen to what Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. He said this, and so he, that is God, condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And so here he says the righteous requirements of the law are fulfilled in us when we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. So on the one hand, we're not under the law. On the other hand, God expects us to fulfill the moral requirements of the law in the power of the Spirit. And so we could say this in the next diagram. You'll notice here that the civil laws have been done away with. The ceremonial laws have been done away with. They have been fulfilled in Christ, but the moral laws 
are still applicable for Christians today because they are repeated in the New Testament and God still expects us not to cheat, not to lie, not to steal, not to commit adultery, et cetera, et cetera. And so we still are required to keep the moral laws of God, not to get saved, not to earn salvation or favor with God. We do it out of love and obedience to God. And so understand that because Christians get into this whole issue, well, Christians are still under the law and there are some Christians that try to take believers and put them under some of the ceremonial laws, some of the feasts and the festivals, and you'll hear this sometimes from Jewish Christians. And I think they mean well, but they try to pull us back into the law and the law has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Romans 10 says that Jesus Christ is the end of the law. In other words, he fulfilled the law, and we still are under the moral law of God. In fact, Paul calls it in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the law of Christ. It is the law of Christ which we obey. So with that, let's pick up in chapter 23 as we continue in these laws known as the book of the covenant. God is going to give Israel some laws that he wants them to wear on their sleeves. He says, you shall not bear a false report. In other words, I don't want you to be a false witness. Whether in a legal setting or in an informal setting, I don't want you to bear a false report or be a false witness. Do not join your hand with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. In other words, don't join with others. He even says that in verse 2, you shall not follow the masses in doing evil. Now, he's not talking about just doing generally evil. He's talking about following the masses in falsely accusing someone and bearing false testimony. He says, nor shall you testify, in verse 2, in a dispute so as to turn aside after a multitude in order to pervert justice. Don't join the crowd in lynching somebody and making up lies and slandering somebody because we all know the consequences of that. It ruins a person's reputation or legally they can end up getting thrown into jail. He says, verse 3, nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his dispute. In other words, just because a person is poor, don't necessarily show them favor. The issue that God is after here is justice and truth because God is a God of truth, he's a God of justice, and he wants us to treat people fairly. And I think we understand that this is a problem in our culture today, especially in the media. The media totally assassinates people's characters. Whether or not it's true, they will tear people apart. I think we understand a couple of years ago, an individual by the name of Brett Kavanaugh, And listen, there's a lot of dispute as to whether or not what he did and what they said, but they never produced any definitive evidence in his life, and yet, not only did our media, but our politicians went after this man. And this has happened to many people, and sometimes it leads to the ruination of their character, other times it can get them thrown into jail. And so, God is very, very specific here that we watch what we say, that we tell the truth, and we bear witness. Jesus was a victim of this. Do you remember during his kangaroo trials? People would stand up and bear false witness about Jesus. He did this, and he did this, and none of their testimonies corroborated one another. And so Jesus understands. In verse 4, he says this, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey wandering away, and the key here is enemy, you shall surely return it to him. In other words, if you see your enemy's donkey, what is your tendency going to be to do? Well, number one is I'm not returning it to my enemy. I'm just going to let the donkey or the ox or whatever go. And in a more malicious sense, you end up killing it. You feed it poison. I knew these neighbors that were having a dispute with one another, and the one neighbor did not like his neighbor was his enemy. And so in order to get his neighbor back, what he did was he took ground beef and he put poison in it and he would feed it to the dog. And of course, the dog dropped dead because he had a vendetta against him. And you see, our natural tendency when it comes to our enemies is we don't want to go out of our way to help them. Now, we may not be as malicious as that. 
where we kill an animal or we kill the person themselves, but we struggle with wanting to help our enemies. He says in verse 5, if you see the donkey of one who hates you lying helpless under its load, here's a, here's a donkey that is basically under the weight of its load and it can't get up, and you have a person who hates you, you shall refrain from leaving it to him. You shall surely release it with him. You see, God is targeting the heart here, and what he's saying is we are not to have a vindictive spirit. We're not to have a hateful spirit towards our enemy. And let's be honest, guys. This is a tough command to obey, is it not? We all have people that we don't like, people that rub us wrong, and maybe people that are we struggle with them being our enemies. Listen, for some of you, it may be politicians. For some of you, it may be a coworker. It may be an ex-spouse. It may be somebody who molested your child and you found out about it later. And man, you wrestle with bitterness and hatred and anger. And the last thing you want to do is bless them. It has to be supernatural. But listen to what Jesus said. And this is a tough command in Luke 6. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. See, Jesus took this to the heart level. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. This has to be supernatural because this runs cross-grain against human tendency. Our tendency is we want to hold a grudge. We want our pound of flesh. We don't want to forgive. He says, if someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other. That was an insult in Jewish culture. Now, Jesus here is not using literal language. You know, if somebody slaps you, you go, ooh, do the other side as well. That's not what he's saying. He's obviously using hyperbole to say this, that you are to be magnanimous when it comes to forgiveness. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Now, I know he's using hyperbole because if somebody knocks on your door and says, hey, man, I want your car. Jesus says here, if I ask for it, you are to give it to me, so give me your car. How many of you would slam the door in their face? Jesus is not using literal language here. The point he's making is we are to be gracious towards people that are our enemies, And we have to work at this in politics. This is a touchy area for a lot of us. And sometimes there are people in the political realm that we don't like, and we have to learn to say, Lord, I pray for them, bless them, save them. Is there somebody here this evening that you don't like? Number one, have you forgiven them in your heart? And number two, are you forgiving them? Jesus said in verse 31 of Luke, do to others as you would have them do to you. He says in verse 32, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? In other words, it's good to love other people and they'll love you in return. There's nothing wrong with that. But really, you're not going beyond the natural. What Jesus is asking here is supernatural. It's natural to love people that love me in return. Everyone does that. He's going to say even the pagans do that. He says even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? In other words, you're not going to get extra brownie points for loving somebody who loves you in return. Not bad, but you're not getting brownie points for that. He says even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting them to be paid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High God. And here is the key. Because he, that is God, is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Ooh, that's tough. Be merciful, just as your father is merciful. And listen, this is Christianity being demonstrated. And you know what? When the church acts like this, this is when the world takes notice of our redeemed life. That's when they see a distinction between us and the world because the world's tendency is what? Arnold Schwarzenegger mentality. I'll be back. You want your vengeance. And he says here, forgive. And so back to Exodus 23, verse 6, he says, you shall not pervert the justice due to your needy needy brother in his dispute. In other words, 
there's a dispute going on. You want fairness. You want justice. God is very concerned about this. He doesn't want there to be perversion in courts. Keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent or the righteous, for I will not acquit the guilty. In other words, make sure that you seek out honesty and justice because you don't want innocent people going to jail. You don't want innocent people going to the electric chair and dying. And so that's why we're very careful with capital punishment. I do believe the Bible teaches capital punishment for first degree murder only. That's the only form of capital punishment is for first degree murder. All the other forms of capital punishment in the Old Testament, we don't apply those to the church today because of Romans 13. It says the government doesn't bear the sword for nothing. And so God says in Genesis, if a person takes another person's life in premeditated murder, their life is required. But you better be careful when you sentence somebody to the death sentence. Why? Because you don't want to kill somebody who's innocent. You shall not take a bribe, verse 8. For a bribe blinds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of the just. In other words, when you take a bribe, obviously it perverts justice on a personal level and on a legal level. Don't falsely accuse others. In fact, have you seen Lady Justice before? Lady Justice, what does she have on her eyes? A blindfold. And notice the pair of scales right there. Why? Because the idea is she's blinded. She's not going to take a bribe, and she's not going to show favoritism. The issue is truth, and that's what we're after. And you see this happen in our culture, like, for example, domestic violence cases. There are some legitimate domestic violence cases that go on, and we don't condone that. It's terrible. But on the other hand, I've heard of a number of cases where a woman or a man will trump up charges to get back at their spouse, and what happens is the spouse ends up getting arrested, and they get thrown into prison or they get fined because one spouse falsely accused the other and ended up getting the police involved in perverting justice. We see this with the Me Too movement. Now, the Me Too movement, a lot of it legitimate. There are women, women that have been taken advantage of, no doubt about it. And men who do that should be criminally investigated, no doubt about that. But you and I know that there are women and men, but primarily women, who will speak up and say that I've been touched inappropriately, I've been raped, I've been this, I've been that, and there's no evidence for it. And what happens is that person's character ends up being assassinated and there's no evidence for it. Or in a worst case scenario, they do time in jail. And so God is very, very particular that we tell the truth and that we don't take bribes because what happens is a bribe perverts justice. In fact, I was reading this week about a man by the name of Mark Civarellis. I don't know if you ever heard of him before, but he was basically thrown into jail and he was an attorney and um, he was involved in what is called a kid for cash scheme. And he was given the nickname Mr intolerance or Mr. Zero Tolerance. And basically what he did in PA was he had a lot of children, thousands of children thrown into prison for minor offenses, juvenile prison. Some of them were given five-year sentences. Like one kid, he took his mom's car, he was 11 years old, and he drove it down the block. That's all he did. Kid stuff. He ended up serving five years in juvenile detention. And this guy put thousands of them away, and you want to know why? Because he was getting a kickback from the juvenile detention center. He made millions of dollars. And so when they finally caught on to his scheme, he was given 27 years in prison, and they reversed like 4,000 of the uh, judicial renderings that were given to a lot of these kids. They reversed them. You see, he was taking a bribe, and he was perverting justice, and God says, we are not to do that. Verse 9, you shall not oppress a stranger. Now, a stranger is a non-Jew that was outside of the nation of Israel. God says, don't oppress them. This would be someone outside of the nation of Israel, since you yourselves know the feelings of a stranger, for you also were strangers in the land of Egypt. God says, look, somebody who's outside of Israel who wants to become a part of the nation of Israel. Now, 
Let me explain what this means because there's two Hebrew words that are used here, and this has implications for immigration. And I don't want to get into the whole discussion of immigration, but this does touch on the issue. The Hebrew word used here in verse 9 for a stranger is the word ger, G-E-R. And what it refers to is someone outside of the nation of Israel who wants to become a part of the nation of Israel. They were given certain privileges and rights as a natural-born citizen. So someone outside of Israel that wanted to become a part of Israel... They were given certain privileges and rights as natural-born citizens, watch this, if they were willing to follow Israel's laws. Did you get that? That's the Hebrew word used here. So you got somebody on the outside of Israel says, I want to become a part of your nation. God says, fine, I'll treat you like a natural-born citizen of Israel, but you got to follow Israel's laws. On the other hand, The Bible says that if a person was not willing to do that, instead of calling them a stranger, ger, there was another term used in the Hebrew, and they were called a foreigner or a sojourner. They were not given privileges and rights. They weren't given the same benefits. You say, well, what's the point? Well, the Bible talks about immigration. It talks about borders in the Bible. There's nothing wrong with immigration. But the Bible makes it clear that it is to be done legally according to Romans chapter 13. And people that come legally into our country, if they want to be here, they must follow the laws of the land. I believe that's what the Bible teaches in the Old Testament. Now, this has a lot of tentacles to it, and I'm not going to get into it tonight. It's a whole other discussion because sometimes what do you do with people who come here illegally? Do you send them back? Some churches do on the border. Other Christian churches will say, well, look, they're here. Let me show them compassion and mercy and give them the gospel. And there's a case for both. But I believe the Bible does teach, based on this word, legal and illegal immigration. You could do a further study of it online, and I believe you'll find it checks out scripturally. So in verse 10, he says, you shall sow your land for six years and gather its yield. But on the seventh year... You shall let it rest and lie fallow so that the needy of your people may eat. And whatever they leave, the beast of the field may eat. You are to do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Now, what God is doing here is he's saying, look, it was an agrarian society. You're to work the land for six years, and you're to obviously get the produce, and you're to live off that. But God said on the seventh year, I want you to allow the land to lie fallow. In other words, you're not to plow You're not to do anything on the seventh year. You can get the crop that grew naturally on the seventh year, but you are not to till the land. And so here's what God had. God had a seventh day Sabbath, and that was on the seventh day. What was Israel required to do on Saturday? They were to rest on the seventh day. But then there was a seventh year Sabbath. So here's a distinction. You'll notice it up on the screen between the Sabbaths. A Sabbath year was every seventh year you were to let the land rest. A Sabbath day was every seventh day, Saturday, you are to rest. And so God said on the Sabbath year, you are to let the land lie fallow. Why? Well, number one, it was to help the poor, he says here in the text, and also animals that would eat. But also, God knew it would restore the minerals on the land. It was a form of increasing the fertility of the land. Here's what one person said about that, and I quote, God in his infinite wisdom knew that anything material would, through the process of aging, deteriorate, and that occasional renewing by the input of new nutrients would be necessary. And so, for all of us, we need to allow our faces to lie fallow. Just kidding. The renewing of nutrients slows the process of what? Deterioration whether it is in man or plants or animals, even the land. And that is the reason for God declaring the Sabbath year. And you know what God said to Israel in Leviticus 25? In that sixth year, when you plant your harvest, since you're not going to plant and sow and reap in the seventh year, you're going to have to trust me in the sixth year. I'm going to give you enough produce in the sixth year so that when you allow the seventh year for the land to lie fallow, 
You're going to have to trust me that I'm going to have to provide. Now, here's what Israel did. They were in the land of Canaan for about 800 years. They rejected this law, listen to this, for 490 years. 490 years they did not obey this command to allow the land to lie fallow every seventh year. And so what God did was when he sent them into Babylonian captivity, you know how long the captivity was? 70 years. 70 times 7 equals what? 490 years. So their punishment was commensurate with how long they neglected the land, 490 years. God disciplined them for that. You say, well, God doesn't care about little things. Yes, he does. And I have to remind myself of that because sometimes we take those little things for granted. Verse 12, he goes now into the Sabbath day. Six days you are to do work, but on the seventh day you shall cease from your labor so that your ox and your donkey may rest and the son of your female slave as well as your stranger may refresh themselves. In other words, God here is saying every, every seventh day you are to rest your body. Now, again, we've talked about this. Is the Sabbath today still applicable? The answer is no. Of all the Ten Commandments, this one has been abrogated or done away with. Colossians chapter 2 says we're not under a Sabbath rest. Jesus is the fulfillment of this. So the Sabbath is a person, not a day. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. Why? Because when we trust in him, we cease from trying to work for our salvation. That's the idea. Now, there is a principle. John and I talked about that this week. There is a principle of rest that all of us should observe. We should have one day where we rest. Now, people are divided on what that rest looks like. Back in the day, probably 80, 100 years ago, a lot of the Christians took the Sabbath literally, and you went home, and you sat at home all day and did nothing. Do you remember all stores were closed? All restaurants were closed? You had to observe the Sabbath. Now, you committed the sin of gluttony on Sunday, but you kept the Sabbath. And then, of course, John Calvin and others said, well, keeping the Sabbath means, you know, if you want to garden, if you want to fish, if you want to play pool. And so Christians are divided on this, but I think the principle is we want to keep the Sabbath. Now, we know that the Seventh-day Adventists, they're the ones who have pushed this. Uh, they're called Seventh-day Adventists because they believe that we ought to strictly follow that commandment in the Ten Commandments. Now, some Seventh-day Adventists have good doctrine, and they don't believe keeping the Sabbath is going to get you into heaven. But there are others who have deviant doctrine when it comes to this whole seventh day, and they teach if you don't worship on Saturday, you're going to hell. By the way, do you know where Seventh-day Adventism has its roots? It has its roots in a movement in the 1800s with a group called the Millerites. Now, the Millerites were a group that followed a man by the name of William Miller. William Miller was a man and a preacher back in the 1800s, and he predicted that Jesus Christ was going to come back in 1843 or 1844. And what happened is he made this prediction, a number of people followed him, and the prediction didn't come to pass. And so all of his followers were disillusioned. And then all of a sudden, there was this lady by the name of Ellen G. White. She covered for him and said, I had a vision, and God showed me that Jesus did come back in 1844, but he came back invisibly. He entered the spiritual temple. Well, that revived the movement. And Ellen G. White and her husband began to get all these visions. And in one of her visions, she said the Lord told her that we are to be strict Sabbatarians. And that was the roots of Seventh-day Adventism. And if you look at their movement, they still study the writings of Ellen G. White. They study a lot of her visions. She supposedly had over 4,000 of them. And so in verse 13, it says this, be careful to do everything I've said to you. Do not invoke the name of other gods. Do not let them be heard on your lips. What does he mean by invoking the name of other gods? Well, God here is probably talking about what Deuteronomy 6 says, taking oaths in his name. God commanded Israel to take oaths in his name. And God is saying, don't invoke my name by using the name of other gods. Again, God is reinforcing here the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. See, God is very particular about this. 
And again, we all struggle with allowing other gods to dethrone God and sit on the throne of our heart. I remember years ago, I was listening to Andy Stanley, and I don't agree with everything Andy Stanley says, but I remember he said in a sermon that when he was younger, this is the son of Charles Stanley, he said one of the things that he became addicted to was centipede. Anybody know the game centipede? I never played the game centipede. I wasn't addicted to it, but how many remember Pac-Man? Remember that game? And some of us, you know, he said, look, he said, that began to take my focus away from the Lord, and I became fixated on centipede, and I had to repent of it. What in your life has dethroned God? You know, if we're not careful, it can be very subtle. It creeps into our life, and we have to be recalibrated spiritually to go, you know what, I got to be careful here because this is becoming a God. This is becoming an idol in my life. This is getting the most attention in my life. Children can become an idol. Your spouse. We all have to be careful. And God here says, don't let other gods be heard on your lips. Verse 14, he says, three times a year you shall celebrate a feast to me. Now these were three required feasts that God required Israel to celebrate. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread for seven days. You are to eat unleavened bread as I commanded you at the appointed time in the month of Abib. For in it you came out of Egypt and none shall appear me before me empty-handed. In other words, you're to make an offering, and you shall observe, verse 16, the feast of harvest, which, by the way, is called also the feast of weeks, of the first fruits of your labors from what you sow in the field. Also, the feast of ingathering, which is the feast of booths or tabernacles at the end of the year when you gather in the fruit of your labors from the field. Three times, verse 17, a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. Now, let me give you the diagram of this. It speaks a thousand words. Here are the feasts that Israel were to celebrate. You have your spring feasts and you have your fall feasts. You'll notice on the left-hand side, you had Passover, which was in April, and unleavened bread. They were often seen as one feast. So God says you're to celebrate this every year. You're not to come before me empty-handed. As you know, you offered a sacrifice, a lamb, and that typified Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. And then you had the first fruits, um, which is when they planted the harvest, okay? And what they do is when they would plant the harvest, uh, the priest would take a sampling of that harvest. It was called a sheaf, and he would wave it before the Lord. That was a symbolic act that the rest of the harvest belonged to God. And so he mentions this one right here. These two kind of go together. They're distinct. But we see 50 days later the Feast of Pentecost. And this has symbolism with Jesus. This represents his death, his resurrection, and then, of course, the giving of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So Passover and Pentecost, God says you're to, you're to observe that every year. And it was to show your thanksgiving not only for God delivering you out of Egypt, but it was to show your thanksgiving for the harvest. And then, of course, he says, I want you to observe this one right here. This is a fall feast. This was tabernacles. And what did Israel do? They built what? Booths, and they lived in them. And that was to commemorate their wandering in the wilderness, among other things. And so God says in this passage, I want you to obey Passover, Pentecost and tabernacle, these are the three that all males were required to go. In fact, Jesus, when he was a young boy, what happened in Luke's gospel? Do you remember? Jesus ended up going to Passover to celebrate it, and you remember he got disconnected from his mother and father because he was teaching in the what? The temple, and of course they were frantic looking for him, and you know the story of that. And so the question is this, do we have to observe these feasts? The answer is no. They have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We are not commanded. Now, there are some Jews today who know Jesus who say that we want to reenact these feasts. I don't have a problem with that as long as you're not making it a salvation issue and you're not confusing it. I think, though, it, it kind of confuses and muddies the water. And so we got to be very careful with that because there are some of them who teach, well, Christians need to get back to that. Colossians 2 says we don't. Jesus has fulfilled these. And I've said this to you before. Go back to that slide. If Jesus fulfilled these feasts in the spring, you know, the question is, 
these feasts will be fulfilled at his second coming. Because you have trumpets, that's the rapture. Then you have the day of atonement, that's the ta- uh, tribulation, the cleansing of Israel. And then tabernacles would be the millennial kingdom. That's the idea and the symbolism that is taking place here. All right, verse 18 as we wind down. He gets a little bit um, colorful here. Do not offer the blood of a sacrifice to me along with anything containing yeast. If you offer a blood sacrifice, don't put yeast in it. Why? Yeast is a symbol of sin. And so Jesus here is typified in a blood sacrifice, and the idea is Jesus is a pure lamb of God. Yeast represents sin. And so he says, don't offer a blood sacrifice with yeast. And you know, sometimes when we offer God our spiritual sacrifices, let's be honest, we often mix yeast with it. Paul talks about the yeast of sin in 1 Corinthians 5. Listen, none of our worship is totally pure because, listen, we're, we're sinners. Even though we are saints who sin, we still are tainted by sin. And so none of us are purely perfect. But we want to offer up to God the sacrifice of praise without yeast. He even says in 1 Corinthians 5, when you celebrate communion, celebrate it without the yeast of wickedness. In other words, God wants us to live a pure life. And so he says, do that. Then he says, the fat, in verse 18, of my festival offerings must not be kept until the morning. Why is God concerned about the fat? The fat was the best portion, and that was to be given to God. It was either eaten or it was burned before the morning. Now, some of you like the fat in steak, don't you? I remember my uncle, my dad, my mom's brother. He loved the fat of steak. And so whenever we'd have a steak dinner, everybody else was, ew, you know, all the women, ew, they'd cut the fat off. And so there was like a mound of fat, and my uncle would take the mound and he would suck it down. He would eat the fat. And we know, listen, fat adds flavor. And so fat symbolized the best. And you know what God wants from us? He wants us to what? Give him the best, within reason, obviously. Remember God said in Malachi chapter 1, shut the temple, close the church, because you're bringing me blind, lame sacrifices. How many Christians give God leftovers, not just financially, but of their time? God says, I'd rather you just shut it down if you're going to bring me the least. Verse 19. And this ties into what he said earlier about the fat. Bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord. It was an agrarian society. And so he says, bring the first fruits of your crops and so and your animals. What God wants is first fruits. God says in Proverbs chapter 3 that if you bring your first fruits to him, that he will bless you. Now, I believe this includes our finances. We need to give our first fruits right off the top. And we need to give what? Our time. Now, that doesn't mean that you're constantly serving God and you don't work and you neglect your family, but it does mean that God is the priority in your life. And listen, there's two ways to know whether or not God is getting your first fruits. Number one, look at your checkbook, and number two, look at how you spend your time. Those two things are a reflection of your priorities. And I believe a 10% is a good place to start when you give. Give a 10%, and then if you want to give beyond that, give beyond that. Give your first fruits to God of your time and your resources. And listen, God will bless you. I'm not preaching prosperity gospel here, but I'm simply saying there is a principle. The blessing may not be financial, but it may be in other forms. If you honor God, he will honor you. And that's what God is saying here. Verse 19. By the way, don't tip God. You know how many Christians tip God on Sunday? You know how many Christians are wearing stolen clothes and driving stolen cars? Because they're taking God's resource and they're using it for themselves. And so he says in verse 19, do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. (laughs) You say, why is God saying this? Well, there's several interpretations. Number one, God is looking out for the inhumane treatment of a young goat. That's one view. So God does care about animals, right? He does have sympathy for PETA, people eating tasty animals. Sorry, I had to add that. Here's probably what he's talking about. This was a practice among the Canaanites. And so God could be saying, don't don't do what the pagans, the Canaanites do. 
And then here's an interesting insight. Goat's milk provided life, so don't take that which gives life and use it for death. In fact, one person said this for your information, strict Jews today refrain from cooking meat and milk dishes in the same pan. Also, they refrain from eating meats and cream sauces. Now, here's an example of a law that does not carry over into the New Testament, right? Do you see this repeated in the New Testament? No, it's not there. Now we end with verse 20, and this is the question because it seems somewhat disconnected from the context of all these laws, and it answers the question, why keep these laws? Why the Ten Commandments? Why the 70 laws of the Book of the Covenant? God says this to Israel as we close in verse 20, behold, I'm going to send an angel before you. Now, some people believe this angel was a Christophany, a pre-incarnate Christ, or they believe it was some powerful angel. It could have been Michael. He says, I'm going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared, which would be the land of Canaan. God says, I'm going to guide you, and I'm going to use either my son Jesus, pre-incarnate, or a powerful angel to direct you. You know, the Bible does say today that God uses angels. Hebrews 1, they're ministering spirits to help those who will inherit salvation. I think when we get to heaven, we're going to be surprised about certain things that happened that we didn't realize it was angelic intervention. Sometimes we don't see things. He says, be attentive to him, that is the angel, verse 21, and obey his voice. By the way, This seems to be Christ because you don't hear that about angels. This seems to imply obey his voice. In other words, this is somebody powerful. Do not be rebellious towards him, for he will not pardon your rebellion since my name is in him. My authority and my character is in him. But if you truly obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversary. He's saying, look, Listen to this angel, because when you disband and leave Mount Sinai, I'm going to take you into the promised land, and this angel is to go before you and lead you. Listen to him, and if you do, he will bless you. Verse 23, for my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will completely destroy them. I'm going to give you victory. In other words, if you listen to this angel and you keep the Ten Commandments and the Book of the Covenant, I'm going to bless you in the land. Verse 24, you shall not worship their gods. When you get into the land, don't worship their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their deeds, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their memorial stones in pieces. In other words, get rid of their religious paraphernalia. You're to burn it in the fire, Deuteronomy 7 says. You are to destroy it. Why? Because Deuteronomy 7 says it will be a snare to you. You know, too often in our obedience to God, we all, we all have snares in our life that we need to throw in the fire. For some of you, it could be a relationship. For some of you, it could be pornography. For some of you, it could be television. We all have to guard our heart, as Proverbs chapter 3 says. He says, and you will serve the Lord your God. In other words, be singularly focused. Get rid of their stuff. Don't fall into their practices. Worship me and serve me. And look what he says he will do. He will bless your bread and your water. And look at this. And I will remove sickness from your midst, verse 26, There will be no one miscarrying or unable to have children in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. In other words, you'll live a long life. Now, let me pause here and say this, because this is a verse that often the prosperity teachers will use among others. And they will say that if you obey the law of God, it says here that you'll live a long life, your spouse will not miscarry, and I'll give you prosperity. And so how would you answer somebody who used this verse? to teach that. What would you say to a prosperity teacher? You see, some of us think that they pull the rabbit out of the hat when they come up with their doctrine. Not necessarily. Some of the prosperity teachers, they will go to the Old Testament and they'll say, what do you do with this verse? Well, there's a simple answer for that. Are you listening? Say amen. Here's the answer to that. In the Old Covenant, under the Mosaic Law, the emphasis was on the material and the physical. You had the physical land. You had the physical tabernacle. 
You had the physical this, that, or the other. Everything was physical. That's what God said. When you get to the new covenant, the emphasis is not on the physical and the material. The emphasis is on the eternal and the spiritual. There's a shift from the old covenant to the new. And this is the Mosaic covenant. Remember, the, old, the uh, Mosaic covenant has been done away with. We are under the new covenant. The new covenant, listen carefully, does not guarantee that your spouse will not miscarry. Because if that's the case, I know women, including my wife, who have had faith but have lost multiple babies. And see, what they have to do is basically blame the person who has a miscarriage or who gets sick with cancer or maybe goes through financial devastation. Well, the problem is your lack of faith because it says, if you do this, this is what God will do. Well, the problem is they're taking the Mosaic Covenant and they're imposing it on the New Covenant. The New Covenant, the emphasis is spiritual and eternal. Jesus said, store your treasure where? In heaven, not on this earth. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, we focus not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. And so the prosperity teachers, although some of them may have good intention... The problem is they never make the hermeneutical shift from the old covenant to the new covenant. And if you camp out here, and also Deuteronomy 28 and 29, which lists all the blessings and the cursings, then listen, I'm going to live a full life. I'll never get sick. And so you name it and you what? Claim it. I claim health. You blab it and you grab it. All you got to do is take the ATM card of faith, put it in, And type in faith, and you will get the blessing. It'll come out. And so what it is is slot machine theology. You put it in, you pull the lever, and God is this benign genie in the sky, and he's supposed to deliver what you want. He says, I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion all the people among whom you come, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs on you. Verse 28, and I will send hornets ahead of you so that they will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites from you. Now, some think this is literal hornets. Others would say it's a metaphor for terror and fear. Because if you read Joshua chapter 2, what did Rahab say? She said, the terror of you is in all of Canaan. They were scared to death of the Israelites. He says in verse 29, I will not drive them out from you in a single year so that the land will not become desolate and the animals of the field become too numerous for you. In other words, God's going to do this progressively. Isn't that how God works in our life? He works progressively and systematically in sanctification. He says, I will drive them out from you little by little. Listen, we want things now and God works little by little until you become fruitful and take possession of the land. He says, I will set your boundary from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the Euphrates River. Here is where God set the boundaries of the promised land, right here. You see it all goes down to the river here in Egypt, and then it goes up here in Iraq to the Euphrates River. This is the territory that God said he would give Israel. Now, Israel doesn't own all this right now, but they will during the millennial. Right now, they only have a sliver He says in verse 32, you shall make no covenant with them or their gods. They shall not live in your land, otherwise they will make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it is certain to be a snare to you. And so this is the reason why God says, keep the Ten Commandments in the book of the covenant. Because if you do, that angel will lead you into the land and I'll bless you. But God's giving him a warning here, if you don't follow me... I'm going to take you out to the woodshed, and I'm going to whip you. And you know what? God was very patient with Israel. He doesn't doesn't whip every single time we mess up. God sent the prophets to warn them, to warn them, to warn them. Read Ezekiel, read Jeremiah, warn them, and they didn't listen. And God says, all right, you're forcing me to take out my switch. And that's exactly what God did. And listen, you know why some of us get into hot water? Sometimes it's not because of us. It's just life. But some of us get into hot water because we won't listen to God. We are recalcitrant. We are obstinate. We don't listen, and God has to spank us. 